This video uh, is going to walk you through the workshop that uh, you can find on our blog. Uh, my name is Dave, uh, and we have with us Mike Damaso. Uh, he's our uh, Android architect. And uh, we're going to be walking you through on screen, uh, setting this up on a Macintosh. Uh, but we also have instructions for how to do this on Windows. So with that, let's get started on the prerequisites. Uh, so Mike already set up a few of these things, but he's gonna walk you through kind of some of the steps that he took. Yeah, so first off, we gotta make sure we've got uh, Docker desktop Kubernetes up and running. So if I go into preferences, um, you can kind of see it in the drop-down menu first and foremost. Nope. But you can also see that I've got Kubernetes running and when I go down here, I've got it. In enabled. Um, so that really should be the only thing I need to do. Uh, when you enable it the first time, there is a kind of a lengthy um, setup process that it goes through. But you should see this turn green when everything's all ready to go. And just as a quick note, um, you don't have to use Docker desktop Kubernetes. <clears throat> you can also use Minikube on both Mac and Windows. Yep, I'm going to skip the Minikube stuff. Um, just because I wanted to try with the Docker setup. Um, I don't have anything to worry about with Hyper-V because I'm not on Windows. Uh, so then I just need to make sure that my cube CTL is running. So let me move over to, um, let's see, what's a good first thing to try to play around with here. Well, if you have, if you want to just show your terminal. Sure. So I'm just going to use the one in VS yep. code. So you can type kubectl space get space namespaces. And namespaces is a way that uh, Kubernetes uh, organizes a lot of the stuff. As we'll see in this workshop, we're going to actually create a couple namespaces to put our stuff into. Uh, the default namespace is where things get put if you don't actually specify a namespace when you're doing your commands. Um, and then the other ones are the Kubernetes uh, namespaces. So if you wanted to see something actually running, you could do kubectl space get space pods space minus n space uh, cube dash system. And these are all the pods that uh, Kubernetes itself uh, installs, or in this case, Docker installed for it when it was setting up Kubernetes. Great. I'm going to swap back to the tutorial now. Um, so yeah, I've already kind of talked through this a little bit. And just so people know, it actually will install that for you when you enable Kubernetes uh, with Docker. Right, yeah, I didn't have to do anything extra to get that up and running. So here we've kind of gone through uh, some of these. Do you want me to pick these off one by one? Yeah, you don't have to do all of them, but uh, you can do a couple just to show people. Sure. So the first one is get clusters. They've only got the Docker desktop okay. one. Yep, kubectl is a client-side um, uh, application, so you can have multiple clusters that it can connect to, uh, both local and uh, remote as well. Um, is there anything interesting in here that you would want me to run to show people? Uh, no, I think we'll get to those uh, later on. Um, I think the next key piece is actually clusters versus uh, context. Um, so if you want to run kubectl config get context, so we typically think of uh, you know, the need to connect to a cluster, um, but kubectl doesn't actually think that way. It thinks in terms of context, which you can basically think of as a cluster plus your authentication. Uh, so whoever you are and how you're authenticating to that specific cluster. Uh, so you don't actually specify clusters uh, when you're doing each of your commands. Instead, you'll specify the context or set up a default as we have here. Uh, you'll see it as an asterisk next to the Docker desktop. That means any kubectl command run without specifying the context, uh, we'll use that one. Okay.
Cool. So let's let's jump right in. Let's uh, create yeah. our first namespace. All right. Great. So here I'll need the data layer namespace YAML. I should already have that because I downloaded everything. Yep. You can, uh, by the way, everyone following along, you can create these files from scratch uh, and copy them from the gist in the article, or you can download them from the uh, Git repo that is linked in the article. Right. Um, so a couple quick things to kind of show you here. Um, the API version that you'll see at the top, that's the version for the Kubernetes API for the thing we're defining. So if you look here, you have a property called kind. That's telling Kubernetes, this is the type of thing that I'm going to try and define now. Um, and the API version tells you which version of, that, of Kubernetes for that thing we're using. Um, and then all types of objects have what's called metadata. Uh, this metadata has a number of different uses uh, for how it creates these things, understands them, and ties them to other things and monitors them. Um, and in this case, we have only one piece of metadata, which is the name. So we're saying we're creating a namespace of name data dash layer. So Great. you wanna go ahead and create that with kubectl. Yep, let me just make sure I am in the right subfolder. Yeah, I think it's the Kubernetes dash YAMLs. There we go. Cool. And basically what we're telling Kubernetes here is we're saying, read in this file and apply the instructions I'm giving you in that file. So if you remember our command from before, uh, you can do kubectl get namespaces and you should see our new namespace. There you go. Nice. And uh, now let's go ahead and do the same thing to create the other namespace, which is our app layer. Right. And that has a different YAML. Do you want me to open that one just to show people? Sure. Only difference is just the name. Yep. Great and then just confirm that it created it. There you go. Nice. Quick thing to, to call out for people following along at home. Uh, basically, you can think of the YAML as creating a contract uh, with Kubernetes. So what you're telling to Kubernetes is not just create this thing, uh, but you're telling it also the state that you want it to make sure is maintained. So we'll see this later when we deploy things like uh, deployments. Um, where we're actually asking it to create living pieces of software and we're saying to it, this is the state I wanna, want you to make sure these things stay in. So if one of them crashes and burns, Kubernetes will look at your YAML and say, hey, it doesn't fit with what you asked me to keep up and it will go and try and restart those things. Mm. Okay. Um, and you can kind of see this, um, so if you scroll down a little bit, you'll see we, if we defined a YAML, you can then actually pull those YAMLs back out of Kubernetes, and it adds into it some extra information. So you'll see at the bottom it has status. Um, that's something that it adds to your deployment YAMLs, which we can check later um, to make sure that it knows what is the current state of this thing that you've defined. Is it fitting that? Do I need to restart something? Uh, do I need to spin up extra you know, versions of this thing? So it's all based on the contract. Great. Nice. All right. uh, so next thing we're gonna do is create a secret. Um, so we obviously need a way since we're deploying a database, for example, in this um, workshop to get the username and password in there. So Kubernetes defines some things called secrets. Um, Really critical and important thing to note for production use is that these are only base64 encoded. They're not actually encrypted. Uh, so typically people will use additional Kubernetes operators from third parties like Mozilla has one called SOPS, Amazon has one called Amazon Secrets Manager uh, in order to properly encrypt that information. We're not gonna do that here, obviously. Um, so 
You have two options for this workshop. You can actually create these from scratch, which is what these commands are doing here. Um, so if you wanna show that, um, we're actually going to do our username and password. And then at the command line, just turn it into base 64 uh, characters. Um, but you can also just use the uh, GitHub uh, ones that we put together already for you. Um, so if you open up the uh, credentials one, the DB credentials, uh, sorry, the other one. Oh, DB. Yep, this one. Yep. Uh, you'll see those uh, username and password actually match exactly what he has in the command line down below. Perfect. Yep. And if you want to go ahead and uh, apply the DB credentials one, um, and while he's doing that, you'll notice a couple interesting things about that YAML. Uh, one is we actually specify the namespace inside this. Um, this isn't necessarily something you always want to do. <clears throat> Certain things you may want to actually specify the namespace based on where you're deploying it into and not directly in the YAML. Uh, but we're just showing that you also have the option here. Um, and then also that it is of kind secret and type opaque. Uh, so secrets actually have multiple different types. Uh, for this workshop, that's the only type we're going to use. Um, and then we're going to create the other credentials one, but we're not actually going to deploy it. Uh, and that's so that we can test out some debugging uh, capabilities later on in the uh, workshop. Um, and that's to look at the fact that secrets, unlike most things, uh, cannot be accessed across namespaces. Most things can, uh, but a few things cannot. And uh, so now if you want to go to the next step. Right. All right. So we're going to create now a database deployment. Oh, uh, if you want, you can first check that the secret was created. Sorry, that's a good call out. Nice. All right, there it is. Awesome. Cool. So next thing we're going to do is we're going to create a deployment. Um, so a couple interesting things to, to note here um, is that we're not in, in the eyes of Kubernetes, we're not defining containers. We're actually defining pods. Uh, and these pods are sort of, you can think of them as the smallest deployable units of compute that you can run in Kubernetes. Um, and within those pods is where our containers are going to run. Um, and then the nodes are the physical or virtual servers on which the pods uh, actually run. So we're not creating pods ourselves. As I mentioned before, we're making a contract with Kubernetes. So what we're actually doing is we're telling Kubernetes, here's the template I'm defining for you, the blueprint of what I want these things to look like. And then Kubernetes will go and figure out how to create that to fulfill what you've asked of it. Uh, in this exact example, we're going to be using MySQL. Um, in production, you would not use uh, MySQL in this way. You would actually have to create a, a persistent uh, volume store. We're not, we're not doing that here because uh, it's beyond the, the scope of this. Um, but you want to create a DB deployment YAML, um, and we'll walk through a few of the different pieces of that. So you'll notice it has spec. Uh, so that's a specification that we're defining. Um, and it's interesting to note it actually has that in two places. Uh, so if you can scroll down just a little bit, Mike. Um, you'll see it down below as well, underneath the template on line 50, I believe it is. Yep. Um, so that's because they're both blueprints. The first spec is the, the blueprint for the deployment, which is this type of thing we're doing. We're saying, hey, we're doing a deployment and it's got a whole bunch of things I want you to do. Within that deployment, we're telling it, I have a template for a bunch of things that I want you to create. Uh, and that's like our containers. And those templates have a specification. Another interesting thing to note um, is the labels. So you'll see we have a selector up on line 31. And down below in the template on line uh, 46, we have labels. Um, so labels are a way that you tell Kubernetes how to apply certain things to other things and how to make sure that uh, contracts are monitoring the right things. So for example, we're telling it, okay, I want you to put the label on each one of these containers that says db-service, or sorry, each pod, db-service, uh, and that the label is gonna be called app. 
that is freeform. That is not built into Kubernetes. App is not a known thing, but it's a pretty common one people make up. Um, and then above, we're telling it that the deployment should match anything that has that label. So it tells Kubernetes, hey, look for anything that has that label. If it's in a bad state that doesn't match this contract here, make sure you get it into that state. Um, and so that's kind of how labels are, are used in a pretty simplified sense. And then down below, uh, you can see we're defining a bunch of containers. Uh, in this case, we're defining MySQL. So we tell it what Docker image we want it to use. Um, and then you'll see we also have environment variables here. Um, so an interesting piece to note for the environment variable. So MySQL group password is a, a environment variable that MySQL happens to know. Uh, it's, it's a uh, predefined one. Uh, but if you look at line 78 through 81, you'll notice something pretty interesting that we're not sending in the value for this password. We're actually telling Kubernetes to go grab it from that secret that we just defined, um, which is that DB credentials. And then we're telling it which one of the things defined in that we want it to pull out, which is the password. Cool. So if you want to go ahead and give this a, a try. Your thing. Cool. And then this, we're going to do a slightly different check. Uh, so do the cube CTL, get pods, minus n, and then data dash layer. And then at the end, put a minus minus watch. So what that does is it runs the command and then it looks for uh, it looks for any changes to that. So it basically keeps polling uh, for that. Uh, unfortunately, we took too long because it only took a uh, number of seconds to run. Um, so you can actually uh, command see that. Oh, sorry. Yep. No, no, that's right. So you can see here uh, we have one of one pods running and ready to go. Uh, and it did not have any bad restarts, so we got no errors. So that's great. So at this point, we actually have a MySQL database fully running, and it is set up to use our root username and our uh, password uh, as well. Uh, but at this point, we actually don't have a good way to reach that. So if we wanted to reach the database right now, we'd actually have to go find out what its IP address is within Kubernetes. Um, and that could be a problem for us because as I mentioned before, there's a contract with Kubernetes. So if for whatever reason, this pod actually shuts down and it restarts it, it may actually restart with a completely different uh, IP address. And for us to keep track of that would be uh, quite a bit of a pain. So we're gonna create a service um, uh, next, which you can kind of think of in a loose sense as a load balancer. Um, and there's a number of different types of these. Uh, there's cluster IP, so that's uh, used only internally. So other things in the cluster can reach this thing uh, via that. Uh, node port is if you wanted to make this externally available on a specific port. Um, interesting to note, you can only use ports between 30,000 and 32,767. It just happens to be what they chose. Uh, you could also create one of type load balancer. So that's where you can do a static IP exposed for incoming traffic. Uh, and then ingress, which is another one that we'll be using in this workshop. Cool. So if you want to Go ahead to this one. So you'll see, uh, again, we have uh, our API version, we have our kind, we have our metadata defining where we're, we're creating this. Um, and then you'll notice we have under here ports. So we have 3306 that actually matches up to the port we previously defined for MySQL to listen on. It happens to be the default port for MySQL. Interesting to note that we're actually defining two ports here. We're defining port that the service exposes. And then we're also defining the target port, which it is going to target on the pods we cre previously created. Um, but by default, Kubernetes lets you specify only port, and then it will use the same value for the target port. Um, and then just for this example, you'll see we have cluster IP set to none. That's just simply uh, because we're not going to actually be creating multiple instances of MySQL. We'll see another option later when we do uh, the REST service. All right, so go ahead and give this a run. Yep. Cool. 
Cool. And then if you want to do the kubectl get services this time, because we've defined a service now, and then minus n data dash layer. And you'll see now we have a service. It's of type cluster IP because we're only looking for this database to be exposed internally uh, to our REST service that we're going to be creating. Great. Cool. So the interesting thing, so this is now accessible within Kubernetes across namespaces, uh, but it could be a bit of a pain for someone to do that because They'll have to know the name of the service, the name of the uh, namespace that it's in, uh, in order to go reach it. And we may want to move it into a different namespace at a later time. So the next thing we're going to create uh, is another type of uh, service. Um, and this one is called external name. Um, so this is just used to make things a little bit simpler and easier to reach across different namespaces. So we're going to define this one um, to be installed in the app layer not the database, not the data layer where the database and its service are. Um, and you'll notice on line 19, we're telling it how to reach across namespaces to get to this service. Uh, but it means within the app layer, we can just refer to db-service and we'll be able to reach the database. Great, so I'll run this now then. And then if you run the same command from before, you'll notice it did not create any new services. Go ahead and run that. And then, but now if you change it to do get services from the app layer, you'll now see our external name is there. There it is. Nice. All right. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to create another deployment in uh, Kubernetes that's actually going to talk to the database. So we're going to do a, a C sharp service. Um, so we have the code for this whole thing up online. Um, it's a very simple, not obviously not productionized uh, service, but uh, if you look at the code snippet, the key thing here uh, that we're showing is we're going to be able to pull out those environment variables that we're injecting for the username, the password, uh, and the MySQL URL. So how we reach uh, that database service. Um, and then we'll just have it create a table and read some data from that table. Um, so we have a Docker file created. Uh, you can think of a, a Docker file as basically an instruction set for Docker on how you want an image to be constructed. Um, so you're telling it, this is how I want you to compile all this stuff, build it, package it. Um, and then we're going to actually put that into um, the image cache uh, for Kubernetes to, uh, to reach. Great. Cool. I'm assuming you actually already did this, but you could always rebuild it if you wanted, but you can just show that it's in the image cache. So if you go to your command line, Right. I actually probably do need to rebuild it. I think I cleared things out. Oh, OK. Awesome. Uh, so you want to go into the sample rest directory, which is actually one level out, I think. OK. Oh, give me the terminal. There we go. And then you'll see we have a Docker file. Mm -hmm. Want me to look at the Docker file? Yeah, you want to just open up real quick. So it, it's what's called a multi-stage commit. So uh, you guys can take a look at this later. But basically what it's doing is it's compiling our C Sharp stuff. It's using a base Docker image that Microsoft uh, put together for .NET applications. Um, and then it's basically taking out and getting rid of the source code and ending up with just the application itself. Um, and we're also telling it to expose port 5000, um, which is just a random port we chose to, to run our microservice on. Uh, so if you want to go ahead and uh, build that, um, so we have the command in the 
workshop. Right. In a snippet. Yep. There. there we go. And just make sure you guys don't miss the, the dot at the end. Mm. Go ahead. And you'll see it's now downloading Microsoft's base image, um, which is going to build this on top of. And now it's getting the .NET SDK. And the important thing to note here with uh, using Docker containers uh, versus you know, running your application, say, on a, a virtual machine, um, is that you're basically baking everything together before you even go to deploy it. Um, and then it's deployed as a fully uh, put together image with your application already on there. So you don't actually start it up and then install your application. Your application is pre-installed on the image that it's creating. And Kubernetes will use this image that we're creating here uh, for our containers, uh, just like we did before with MySQL. Um, and we told it to use the MySQL image. Uh, I think we did version 5.6. Cool, mm -hmm. so it's created it. Um, and now if you go ahead and do Docker images, um, it should show you that it is installed. There it is, the top one, uh, sample rest. Awesome. Nice. Um, if you are using Minikube, uh, there is one extra command that's on the, the workshop that you'd have to run just to put it into Minikube's cache. All right. So now let's go ahead and um, we're going to do our app rest deployment. Uh, so most of the stuff is the same. A couple things to call out that are slightly different from before. Line 24, um, you'll see it has image pull policy never. Uh, that's very important that you have that. The reason is there are if you don't have it, it will go and look at whatever Docker um, image repositories you have set up. Right now, Docker's default one in the cloud is actually uh, set up. And there is, in fact, some other applications called sample rest, uh, and it will pull the wrong thing. Um, so what we're telling it is don't pull the image from externally. Look in your local cache uh, to pull it where we just defined it. Uh, another interesting thing to note here is the container port matches up to what we exposed in our Docker container. Um, at 5,000. Um, and then down below, you'll notice we have the URL on line 42 uh, for MySQL. And notice how simple it is. It's literally just the name of our service within Kubernetes. And that's because of that external name we created. Right. All right. So if you want to go ahead and apply that. Oops, what was the file name again? It was app dash app rest. rest. Yep. Oh. Dash deployment. Yeah, I gotta go. Oh yeah, you you gotta go. Yeah. Good <laughs> good call out. Okay. There we go. Okay. Go ahead and run it. All right, and now do kubectl get pods minus n app layer. And you will see an error. This is this is good. We, we want an error. Um, sorry, what was the minus n? Yep. Okay. Uh, app layer. Yep. Cool. And you'll notice there status. Uh, we have an error. Um, so what we're going to do the reason for that error is, as I mentioned before, even though we defined a secret, uh, you cannot actually reach that secret from this um, uh, namespace. So we're going to go and figure out what happened. So if you want to go back uh, to the workshop, there's a command there that you can copy, kubectl get events minus n app layer, uh, right above hands on. Oh, yeah, yeah you got it. Um, and this is very useful for discovering things that go wrong when you're you're trying to deploy uh, stuff. So you'll notice on the third line, right there, that's our problem. We don't actually have DB credentials defined. So let's go ahead and uh, define that. Um, so remember, you created previously the app DB credentials YAML. So let's mm -hmm. just go ahead and apply that. So this file here. Yep. Yep. 
And then let's actually delete our previous uh, one. So if you go back to the workshop, you'll find that command there. So scroll down a little bit, right there, yep. Delete. Yep. And now go ahead and reapply it. And now go ahead and check the pods in the app layer. Okay. And now you'll notice we have it running without any errors. Perfect. Nice. All right, and now let's go ahead and create a REST service. Um, so a couple of small differences here um, from our previous service. Um, one is you'll notice we actually are specifying under the ports, the protocol, uh, the port and the target port. Um, so as I mentioned before, we don't technically have to define the target port since they are the same. Uh, but we just called it out here so you can see you could actually have different ports that you're exposing from the service versus what you have in your actual uh, application. All right. Go for it. And then if you want to check it with the kubectl get services in the app layer. Nice. Okay. Uh, next thing we're going to do. So now we have a REST service that can reach our database, but our REST service is actually not available externally from Kubernetes. Uh, so this is where we're going to define what's called an ingress. Uh, so you can kind of think of an ingress as a external uh, gateway or router or uh, externally available load balancer. Um, if you're doing this with Minikube, we've got the commands there for you. If you're doing it in Docker Desktop, we have that command for you here as well. This is basically enabling um, the ability to do an ingress in uh, your Kubernetes. And in here, we're gonna use uh, Nginx. Uh, it actually uses Nginx on Minikube as well. Awesome. And then now, Let's go and define our ingress. So if you scroll down a bit, um, so you'll notice a couple really interesting things here. Um, at the top, line four, you'll notice the API version. Um, that is a, the version for this ingress is actually defined under Kubernetes networking uh, stack. Um, and then down below on line 15, we have something new which is annotations. So annotations are a way that you can pass a specific configuration to the thing that you're defining. Um, so in this case, uh, we're defining an Nginx in ingress because uh, we just set that up in the previous command. Um, and one of the things uh, that it does is rewrite. So we're basically doing that uh, because the specified path that comes into it um, and that it sends onto the Kubernetes uh, uh, service that we've set up uh, do not necessarily match up. So we're basically rewriting it to something that's uh, relative uh, that the service will understand. Um, and then down below, you'll see we're going to expose a new URL. It's okay, this URL doesn't actually exist, but we'll be creating that ourselves. Um, and you can actually tell it what to find behind it to send these requests to based on specific criteria. So we're saying all paths at the root we want it to send on to our service called app rest, which we just defined uh, a minute ago on port 5000. If you want to go ahead and apply that. Sure thing. Fantastic. Um, and then again, you can check this by doing the kubectl CTL get ingresses in the app layer. Ingresses. Yep. Cool. And you'll want to grab the address that you see here. In your case, uh, it's localhost. Um, okay. But in some cases, you may see an actual IP address uh, here. It depends on whether you're using, say, Minikube versus uh, Docker. But make sure you grab that address, uh, whichever it is. Uh, so next thing we're going to do is we're going to go to your hosts file. 
um, we have where it is on Windows in, in the workshop. Um, and then for Mac, um, Mike is going to go do that. Um, and he's going to set up his host file to go to that uh, URL. So basically, the reason we're, we're doing this, um, you could have set up an actual URL somewhere and redirected it to wherever you're working. But uh, we want to make sure that the ingress allows specific domains to be redirected to specific services. In this case, we're doing it to the REST service. Um, and the way you do that locally is by using your host file um, to tell it to use. The browser will end up uh, using your local DNS to figure out that uh, DraftKings K8S is going to go to uh, your uh, exposed ingress on your Kubernetes cluster. Um, and one interesting thing to note, if it had localhost, as you saw with Mike's, uh, you'll actually want to use 127.0.0.1, which is uh, essentially the same thing. It's the loopback address. And once Mike has that set up, um, we'll be able to go to it in a browser, um, and it will go to the ingress, which will then be sent to your app rest service, which will then send it to the uh, C-sharp application, which internally will actually go and tell the database to create a table. It'll tell it to put some data in it, and then it will read that data back out uh, and print that out to the page. OK, so I'm done with that now. So I'm going to just go to the website. Yep. All right, fingers crossed. <laughs> hey, it worked. There we go. Awesome. Fantastic. Um, and basically what this has done now by him doing that is, like I said, it's gone from the browser to your ingress to your app rest service load balancer, from there to your actual pod, uh, which sent it onto your container, which went to your C-sharp application, which then reached back out across namespaces via the external name to the database service, uh, which then went to your actual database. Awesome. That's very exciting. Yeah, fantastic. Great job. Um, hey, and, good workshop. Uh, thanks. And then our next one up, actually, we're, we're going to be doing a part two later on. Uh, where we're actually going to look at Helm, uh, which will make a lot of this stuff much easier uh, to deploy. So you won't have to deploy 10 different uh, YAMLs. Instead, you'll be able to deploy one application. Great. Very cool. Thanks for all your help, Mike. Yeah, thanks for walking me through this.